It is a joy to welcome each and every one tonight. We have had a wonderful evening, wonderful afternoon, rather, and looking forward to our service. Uh, we want to uh, remember any announcements. Do you have any tonight? If no announcements, as prayer requests, let's remember the Alderman and Julius, they'll be singing tonight. In fact, they are just getting started as well as we are. So let's remember them as the Lord will bless them. And I pray that they'll have fruit from their labors. And we pray for our service here tonight as well. Anyone you'd like to mention out loud, we certainly want to keep Tal and Amber in prayer for all their family. Amen. And uh, for the loss of their father, Mr. Kim. Anyone else? Uh, one of my good friends from one of my good friends from high school had back surgery a few weeks ago, and uh, he's uh, he's not he's getting down. I believe he's he's not. It's not healing as fast as he thought it would. And you know, six months. It's only been about four weeks, and he's getting antsy. But it's very important that uh, that he get prayers because he's Santa Claus. He plays Santa Claus uh, in the local. Parades, and he's actually been in our state magazine. And they're already asking him, Are you going to be able to be Santa Claus? So we've got to keep the kids happy, make sure to pray, to pray for Santa Claus. His name's Rick Franklin. Thank you. I have a dear sweet friend. Her name is Tracy Thomas, and she's battled breast cancer. And um, Lord's taking care of her. <coughs> but they also found a uh, little spot on her one of her lymph nodes, and I would like her to people to please pray for her. She has a faith, and that's what's keeping her strong. Amen. Anyone else? <coughs> Brother Eugene, would you lead us in prayer? Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for allowing us to be here, Lord, to worship you tonight, Lord. We thank you for today. We thank you for all the many blessings that you've given us, Lord, the ones that we've asked for and the ones we've not asked for. Lord, please take all these prayer requests, Lord, that we've heard tonight. And Lord, please place your hand to heal and come in order to be your Lord. And in your name we pray. Amen. Okay. Well, it's time we're going to be favored by Brother David with the song that the Lord has laid upon his heart. So let's, let's give him a hand back to the Lord. This is my song of uh, testimony, made in purity. is 
Psalm 119, verse 63, companionship, companionship. We uh, want to say welcome to those that have tuned in to us as well from Facebook. We pray that you will be blessed as well. Uh, always a joy to see everybody in person. And if you can let us know if you have watched it by either liking it or making a comment, that would be great. We'd be love to know who we want to stay in touch with us. We want to be a blessing to everyone. So Psalm 119, verse 63. I am a companion of all them that fear thee and of them that keep thy precepts. Our Heavenly Father, we are grateful, Lord, for this opportunity to once again stand before your congregation to read out of your Holy Scripture and to present the message as you have laid it out before me. I pray that your will will be done in all of our lives as we respond in the invitation. And I pray your Holy Spirit leads us and guides us, gives us what we need to help us in our daily walk. And may you always be honored and glorified. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Now, nobody knows exactly who wrote this song, Psalm 119. Many Bible scholars believe it was David because there is a lot of similarities to some of the other Psalms. And so we're going to go with that thought that David wrote this Psalm. And if you know anything about David, he has often expressed his great love for God. In many of the Psalms, he tells us over and over how much he loves God and how much he honors God and tries to live for him. Here in this psalm, in particular in this verse, the psalmist, whether it's David or not, but we're going to treat it like it is, he expresses his great love for the people of God. And so that ought to go hand in hand. If you love God, you ought to love God's people. Amen. And we're going to read some scriptures that back that up as well. And so uh, the psalmist, David is teaching us in this verse that we should have a high regard, that we should have a respect and a close bond to our companions, those people who God puts into our lives. And so without respect of persons, I might add. And that's the way David was. David never had a respect of persons. David treated everybody 
with the same love. And we'll share that later on as we get to the message as well. But when we are walking in this life, we ought to treat the rich and the poor, the prince and the pauper all the same. Because we are companions together with one common bond, and that is Jesus Christ who has saved us all. Our walk of life is very much affected by whom we associate ourselves with. Let me say that again. Our walk of life is very much affected by whom we associate ourselves with. If we associate with evil persons, then that's going to rub off on us. And we might turn into an evil person. So where is the scripture to back that up? Well, I'm glad you asked. 1 Corinthians 15, 33 says this. Be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. Evil communications corrupt good manners. Being around evil people will corrupt you and you'll become an evil person. But then think about this. If we associate with those who are negative and critical, most likely we're going to turn out to be a negative person and critical person. You ever known anybody like that? That they started hanging around somebody in particular and what well, long they started acting just like them, being critical, being negative, finding fault and everything. But then consider this. If we associate ourselves with God's people, those who love God and those who revere God and fear Him, then our hearts and our souls will benefit from that companionship. It is said in Proverbs 27, verse 17, these words. Iron sharpeneth iron, so a man sharpeneth the countenance of his friend. How good it is to glean off of one another. When I become a Christian, I was just a young boy. But as I grew into manhood, I wanted to hang around men and women of faith. I would hang around deacons and preachers and good, strong Christians and glean from them and what they could offer to me to help me become stronger in Christ. And a lot of times it was wonderful and great, but then you'd have some of the other folk who talked about those evil communications or those negative critical people that would try to want to get into that circle. And I'm welcoming to all people. But listen, even Jesus, he sat down with the sinners, but he didn't become a sinner and become of their sins. And so we need to be careful how far we go in our relationships. We need to be around people who are lost. How else are we going to win them to Christ? But don't let them drag you into what they do that is sin. You know, we think about our family. We didn't have a choice and who our family is. We were born into the family. But we do have a choice in who our companions are. And so choose your companions wisely. Most of the time, we choose companions who share our same values. We choose companions who share our same beliefs. We, we make a companion out of someone who has some of the same interests that we have. And so to be companion is to have fellowship with someone in some of the daily activities in which we partake. And so the things that we have in common with another Christian is our faith and our salvation. Amen. That's something we all have in common with each other. And all of those who fear the Lord have been made alive by the Spirit of God who has moved inside and taken residence. Our companionship shows itself as we assemble together. We find in Hebrews chapter 10, in verses 22 through 25, these words. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, 
not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Listen, we assemble, there are typically four reasons why we come together. The first and foremost is we come together to worship. We worship by the music. We worship by the singing. We worship by the prayers. We worship through the tithes and offerings. We worship as the message is given out. We worship when the invitation is extended and we find ourselves at the altar interceding for others and praying for ourselves or simply coming and saying, God, I have no selfish motive in mind today. I just want to come down here and tell you I love you. And I just thank you for what you're doing in my life. You ever thought about coming to the altar just to thank God? You know what most people think? Well, if I go down to the altar, they're going to think I've done something wrong this week and I'm needing forgiveness. Not necessarily. That may be true. But listen, I'd rather have God's favor upon me than to worry about what folks think. And sometimes I come down to the altar just to say, God, I want to tell you how much I love you and I thank you for what you're doing in my life. And so we worship first and foremost when we come together and assemble in the Lord's house. And then we come together for instruction. This instruction goes beyond hearing the messages. It goes into the Sunday school class or the Wednesday night class or the Awadas or vacation Bible school. And so we receive this instruction and we hear this instruction and we try to apply it to our hearts and our lives. So we worship and we receive instruction. But then third, we minister. Now we minister through different ministries within our church. Uh, we have different committees that minister for the whole body of the believers. We have certain uh, ministries such as Sunday school, like we mentioned a while ago, the Awanas that reaches out and touches people. We have the care ministry that we're fixing to get reinstated. Hey, here's an announcement. This thing on. Care ministry fixing to start back up in January. So think about signing up. And we'll have a meeting just before we get started and sign up. And hopefully you'll be a part of that. We'll get it about November. So we'll start talking more about it. And so we think about ministering. But then there's a fourth reason we come together, and that is fellowship. You know, the devil offers so much for people to be involved in. I think God's people ought to incorporate fellowship more than we do. Because the devil certainly offers it. And so God's people want to get together in fellowship as well. Amen. <coughs> Our companionship shows itself as we face tribulations and trials. As we go through difficult times. In fact, let's look in 2 Corinthians chapter 1 verses 3 and 4. 2 Corinthians 1, 3 and 4. Blessed be God even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforted us in all our tribulations, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. When you think about what that verse, those two verses are saying, God comforts us where we can go out Comfort of now, I know what you're thinking. Well, why don't God just go out and comfort them like He did us? Well, He just may be speaking about those who give God no thought, who never attend church, never read the Bible. You know, we as Christians go through a lot of the same things that other people go through, and because we have gone through certain situations in our life, we can identify with what that person is experiencing and we can be used to minister to them in a way that nobody else can. Whether it's the loss of a child, the loss of a husband or a mother, going through a divorce or going through some sickness or whatever the case may be, you may be able to identify with that individual like nobody else can. So God comforts us so that we may be able to go and be used of him to comfort others. He will speak through us as we reach out to others. 
And so we need to do that. We need to be companions. When death knocks on our door, or knocks on our neighbor's door, or knocks on a church member's door, we, we need to be used of God to show companionship. When sickness has invaded the home and somebody's in the hospital or the convalescent home or the rehab center or maybe just trying to deal with our sickness in their own way, we could be a companion and a friend to them and just show some love. Or maybe we're, they're going through some type of distress. It could be a loss of a job. It could be a situation that's got their heart pounding faster and faster. And we could go and be a companion to them and help them to calm. The origin of companionship is found in Jesus Christ. Amen? Let me say that again. The origin of companionship is found in Jesus Christ and extends itself to all of those who are in Christ. In 1 John chapter 5, verse 1, Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone that loveth him that begat loveth him also that is begotten of him. So that scripture simply says if we love God we ought to be loving one another. If we love the one who begot us all then we ought to love each and every one that's being begotten from him. Speaking of salvation. And so we need to love each and every one. That mean we agree with each other on it? We, we all know that's not going to happen. But we can agree to disagree in an agreeable fashion and keep on loving one another. That's what Jesus is speaking about in all the scriptures. By this shall all men know you are my disciples indeed if you have love one to another. Just as David wanted to show kindness for Jonathan's sake, you and I need to show kindness for others as well. In fact, it says in 2 Samuel chapter 9, verse 1, these words. And David said, Is there yet any that is left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? David and Jonathan were close. They were close. And when Jonathan and Saul died in battle, years had passed. And David was sitting around one day and thinking about his good friend, Jonathan. And he began to inquire, is there anybody left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for the sake of my friend, Jonathan? And they went out searching and one came back and said, yes, there is one. His name is Mephibosheth. He is Jonathan's own son who became paralyzed, he become crippled as they were fleeing for their lives and the nurse dropped them and he was crippled from that point on. And David searched him out and showed him kindness and said, you're going to be sitting at my table from this moment on and everything that is of mine and of my children is of yours. You will share as one of my own. That's how much David wanted to do for other people. Is there any of the house of Saul left that I may show him kindness? And so should we. We should be wanting to show other people kindness. Seek them out and search them out and try to be a, a companion, a friend in need. Just as God showed kindness to you and me for Jesus Christ's sake, you and I ought to show kindness to one another as well. As we seek companionship for God's sake. It is said in Ephesians chapter 4 verse 32 these words. And be ye kind one to another. Tender hearted. Forgiving one another. Even as, as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. God for Christ's sake hath forgiven us. And so the scriptures teach as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven us. We ought to forgive one another as well. That's how much companionship truly means. You and I ought to show kindness and seek companionship for God's sake. And then the scripture teaches us, when we think about it, that we need others for companionship. We need one another for companionship. 
In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, we find, begin reading in verse 14 through 27. 1 Corinthians 12, 14 through 27. For the body is not one member, but many. If the foot shall say, because I am not the hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear shall say, because I am not the eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where were the smelling? But now have God set the members, every one of them, in the body as it pleased him. And if they were all one member, where were the body? But now are they many members, yet but one body. And the eye cannot say unto the hand, I have no need of thee, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. Nay, much more those members of the body which seem to be more feeble are necessary. And those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, upon these we bestow more abundant honor. And our uncomely parts have more abundant comeliness. For our comely parts have no need, but God hath tempered the body together, having given more abundant honor to that part which lacked. That there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care one for another. And whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it, or one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now ye are the body of Christ, and members in particular. Now wouldn't that be funny? To see an ear walking around. Just an ear. We'd say that's strange. <laughs> or you just see one great big eye. Just wilding around with two arms sticking out. That'd be funny. And that's what he's trying to make a point of. We all work together. And we can't say well. Uh, I'm not the ear so I'm not important. Or I'm not the eye so I'm not important. He says those uncomely parts are just as important as the comely parts. Something you don't think about a lot is your eyelash. Or let's just say your eyelid. But you let a bunch of dust start coming through your mowing grass and that dust starts stirring up and you close those eyes to try to avoid that dust. But say you didn't have no eyelids. Boy, you'd be working that water all through the night trying to clean your eyes out. You see, every part of the body is important. Now, some of the members of our body gets more attention than the others. I mean, we first thing we notice about people is their face or the shape of their body or their hands. You can take the most beautiful woman in the world. I guarantee you there's something about her body she don't like. It may be her little toe. But there's something she don't like about her body. And that is true of all of us. We think there's something that always needs to be fixed. But God has put us together. And in a church body, we all work together for the benefit of God's glory. We all work together for God's glory. Amen. And that's what we call companionship. We seek companionship from God. It's a wonderful thing when we fellowship with God. But we also need that companionship with one another. Amen. Our Heavenly Father, as we close out tonight, as we have been given another thought of how important companionship is, I pray that you would help us to seek out companionship from others, but also that we would be willing to be a companion to those who need one. May you bless us in this time of invitation. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's all stand.
testimonies or comments you'd like to share with us. God bless you. Have a wonderful week. I'd love to see you back on Wednesday night as we continue the book of Proverbs. And uh, then next Sunday, we're going to have a wonderful drama. Our youth choirs will be singing a brand new song, never been heard before in this church. And I'm excited about it. And then the drama itself, and we've got different folks helping pitch in. And so uh, go out this week and invite some folks. If you know someone that's never accepted Christ, try your best to invite them and have them come. Because they're going to hear the gospel in a dramatization. All hearts, minds clear. Brother Jeff, would you close us in prayer?